when Hegel, the political philosopher, got up to give his inaugural lecture in Berlin, he had uh, pressing concerns on his mind. He said that the future of philosophy was at stake. And only the Germans, and more particularly Hegel, could save that discipline. Uh, like Hegel, I want to start locally, but I don't propose to make grand world historical claims for what follows. I'll leave you to judge their worth. Um, by locally, I mean southwestern England. If we go back to the 9th century, the then King of Wessex, Alfred, um, exerted a really significant influence on practical life in that context. And this is memorialised beneath the statue that appears on the overhead in the town of Wantage in Dorset. The inscription says, Alfred found learning dead and he restored it, education neglected and he revived it, the laws powerless and he gave them force, the land ravaged by a fearful enemy, specifically a Danish enemy, from which he delivered it. To speak the language of Newcastle University in 2014, Alfred was a very significant agent of social renewal. Um, among other things, he moved the project of a United English Kingdom forward. It became more imaginable under his influence, but it remains still a work in progress. And I mention him now for a very particular reason. He saw knowledge as a condition of the exercise of power on a legitimate basis, the exercise of power leading to claims to authority. And it's this tight association between knowledge, power, and authority that connects up with my interest in law as a practice, as does his interest in the fact that law was embedded in a wider context, a wider form of life, over which it could exert a very significant and constructive influence. What you find in Alfred is what Peter Ackroyd calls a kind of earnest practicality. Focused on local matters as he was, he reached out to Roman influences that had shaped his thinking as a youngster. He was influenced by Pope Gregory's pastoral care. He looked abroad and found guidance in the model of Charlemagne. Uh, he was a broad thinker who saw in law a significant force for good in practical life. And that leads on to my particular interest in law as a practice. Let me say something on law as a practice. This phrase is often thrown into the mix by academic commentators. George Fletcher is someone for whom I have very great admiration. And he expresses an interest in law as a practice. He connects it up in the grammar of criminal law with the basic conceptual ordering of law, but he doesn't press the analysis far enough. He fastens on things that are very familiar to all of us. Activities like legislating, litigating cases, resolving disputes more generally. It all makes sense, but Fletcher could have gone much further. And I'm going to argue that if we're going to get to grips with law as a practice, we have to recognise it's vital that we do this, that we sit at the end of a very long timeline and we are fortunate to have come into possession of a very rich, very elaborate social form. We have very high hopes where law is concerned precisely because we sit at the end of a very lengthy timeline. I describe law as a social form for, among other reasons, <coughs> one that Joseph Raz gives, that the idea of a form is something that brings with it the idea of fidelity, if we embrace it, we engage in it according to its terms and we seek to move it on. I'm going to argue, if we're going to make a useful attempt to get to grips with law as a practice, we've got, so far as we can, to begin at the beginning. So I'm going back far in time in an effort to get to grips with law as a practice. Shortly, I'll be tracing two relevant timelines to help bring matters into focus. But before I do that, let me say something generally about law as a practice. I start with the assumption that practices begin naively. Someone I find enormously helpful here is Michael Oakeshott, 
who says of activities that they begin naively, like games that children invent for themselves. Each appears first as a direction of interest pursued without premonition of what it will lead to. So at this point on the timeline, things are not very tightly specified. But we can see in this effort to move an activity on a process of knowledge acquisition, a keener sense of direction, and the activity can begin to assume the form of something that looks like a practice such as law. And alongside this, I want to set the point that the practice I'm talking about is intersubjective, it's shared, there are shared commitments to values within it, and it's sustained by a growing sense, a necessary sense of collective intentionality, a necessary feature of the construction of social reality in a legal and in other forms. Now, let me just say something about this phrase of Oakshot, a direction of the interest to be pursued without premonition of what it will lead to. That's an important phrase early on the timeline because it sharpens up the sense in which what we're talking about exhibits a kind of open-endedness. There's an element of adventure in the activity. Options are not tightly specified at this point. And I want to contrast that with something that Lorn Fuller says of law when he talks of law in quest of itself. It's a striking, memorable phrase, but I have problems with it insofar as it assumes right here, right now, an ideal that we can grasp, it's clear and plain to sight, and what we're engaged in is the activity of bringing our imperfect practices into conformity with it, or at least better approximate it, uh, better approximating it. What I want to suggest is, if you buy into the full of you, you're going in search of something that in our minds at least, is already there. Now, a lot of what we're reaching out to try and bring into focus is not clear to us. Think of our self-understanding. A lot of the time, people experience themselves as distant mysteries. I'm not entirely sure what shape my life should have. And I want to suggest, early on the timeline, law is something like that. Gilbert Ryle is helpful when he describes thinkers as wanting to acquire a grasp of something that's not yet within reach. Early on, I think law is rather like that. And it's difficult for us to grasp that because we're the inheritors of a very rich set of understandings about law that make a great deal of sense to us. Oakeshott is helpful here again when he says, in On Human Conduct, intelligibles emerge out of misty intimations. When noticings become thoughts, and we come to inhabit a world of recognisables. And I want to set that alongside something said by someone well known to us here in Newcastle, Mary Mitchley, when she talks of originating visions as necessarily vague. I'm sure visions often are vague. I hesitate to talk in terms of originating visions. It seems to me that visions are often the stuff of inductive mental activity that precedes them, we reach back into our practice, we draw from it something that ultimately assumes the shape of the vision, and we can think here in terms of a kind of slow-growing wisdom of the sort Carl Llewellyn talks about when he discusses the common law, a kind of slow movement towards idealization over long stretches of time. And we can see in this the idea that Mandeville talks about when he says that human wisdom is indeed a child of time. So to sharpen all of this up, I don't want to use the loaded language of progress, so let's talk in terms of ramification. Out of a kind of background, the context in which we're situated, emerge noticings. Noticings yield a direction of interest. Out of that direction of interest, we find misty intimations. Misty intimations yield intelligibles. Intelligibles become recognisables. Recognisables, through a process of induction, lead on to necessarily vague visions. But ramification on that model is connected up with higher levels of self-consciousness, yielding visions in the form of ideals, goals, end states, and imaginable 
and sometimes desirable future. Not always we could be propelling ourselves in the direction of something awful, but it seems to me that helps in moving on our understanding of law as a practice. And alongside that, we can make the further point that what's going on reflects what Joseph Rass talks about when he speaks in terms of the root dependence of understanding. We understand new things by relating them to what we already know. And on a practice-based view, we're acquiring an internal, critical, reflective point of view, and we can use that to reflect on what's out there in our environment and how we should respond to it. And over time, we see the emergence of theory, at least in a loose sense, higher order generalizations, strong declarations of basic beliefs, descriptions of underlying assumptions. The practice is ramifying over time. And on occasion, we may feel a sense of movements towards some kind of non-local truth. I would connect that with the philosopher Hegel, but we'll leave that for another day. Um, what I want to say about this process of ramification where law is concerned, think of law developing into a system, think of that system as a normative space that's stretching itself across an expanse of time. This is experienced as something of a continuity, a duration, to use Bergson's language. We can think of a tradition as a duration. Someone who, in a rather short sentence, is, is helpful here if you devote quite a bit of time to thinking about the sentence, more time than I've got now, it's helpful, is Pocock. I'll just read through it. Um, the consciousness of time acquired by the individual as a social animal is in large measure consciousness of his or her society's continuity and of the image of its continuity which that society possesses. And the understanding of time and of human life as experienced in time, disseminated in a society, is an important part of society's understanding of itself. So we are in this continuity, this normative space, this duration. It's investing us with some sense of ourselves. We see what's unfolding as a tradition, and if we take it seriously, we look for reasons for action within it. I want to link all of that to an important strand of my argument. This is something in Immanuel Kant's philosophy that is too little emphasized. His emphasis on pragmatic knowledge of the human being, which concerns the invest investigation of what he, to use the gendered language at the time, or she as a free acting being, makes of him or herself, or, or can and should make of him or herself. And Kant goes on to say that the particular nature of human beings can only be grasped, can only be cognized in experience. Well, let me pose the question now. How are we to do this? How are we to acquire this knowledge of what we are and what we might become? Law is a means to that end. Law is a mechanism for the exploration of human potential. Um, <clears throat> to connect the two things up, we can think of activities, practices as a shared but not necessarily just investigation, involved with exploring the bounds of practicable human possibility. And Kant says if we do this sort of thing, we can hope for enlightenment for common life. If things go well, and they're not necessarily going to go well, we could fasten upon enlightenment of use vis-a-vis -vis common life. And where that happens, pragmatic anthropology becomes moral anthropology. This happens when we choose to make use of our knowledge with the aim of securing the interests of huge humankind and building in institutions that have use for people. Um, let's just represent that in a kind of schematic way. Think of this idea of enlightenment for common life. Think of law as a practice that begins naively, it ramifies. We're engaged in the exploration of the bounds of practicable human possibility. We're engaged in the project Kant calls pragmatic anthropology. And we can think of what's going on as a duration or a tradition extending through time. Law as a normative continuity. Now in a sense, how easy all of that sounds, but how difficult it is to do in practice. Not least 
because we have to wrestle with an inescapable problem, the fact of flux. Nothing stands still. We have to wrestle with the passing show. Heraclitus says you can't step in the same river twice. Wittgenstein says all is in flux. William James says without fruitful ideas to guide us, we confront a blooming, buzzing confusion. And that's where practices come in. Think of practices as procedures to help us cope with the fact of flux. Practices as procedures promise to deliver some measure of stability, coherence, a well-ordered framework. But there's a problem. Bergson brings this into focus. Practices are part of the continuous creation of ongoing, unforeseeable novelty. The solution to our problems becomes a continuation of those problems. We seek to stabilize, but all remains in flux. And this is something picked up when we look at legal debates. Scott Shapiro is helpful here. Think of legal debates as moving targets. They are difficult to represent. Not least, these evolving entities are highly adaptive to rational pressures, pressures, rhetorical pressures, and highly contingent practical pressures. However, I'm going to argue that we can see timelines, and I'll present you with two, as a way of representing movement and continuity in legal and related debates over substantial swathes of time. Some people, the classical commentator Cratylus, would reject this. He doesn't think we can even step in the same river once. We haven't even got time to name things. They change so rapidly. All you can do is point at them as they fly by. I don't think that is entirely accurate. Okay, so timeline number one. Let's go back to classical antiquity. Homer, in his poems, The Iliad and the Odyssey, brings into view an account of practical life in the Mycenaean era, edging into um, classical antiquity closer to us. And we can find obvious commitments to law and associated values on justice to legal process. And Bernard Williams, looking at Homer, says his poems are linked to us by an enormously complex tradition. They continue to resonate, not least, because they capture a sense of agency that's coming into view and is strongly felt by us. If we move closer in time to us along timeline one, we can see the legal system builders, Lysurgus and Solon. Um, Lysurgus is something of a mythic figure, a deeply disputed figure, but associated with the construction of the Spartan legal order. Um, if we come closer in time again, Plato dwells on political legal order, the idea of justice, and a distinct model of human association. Not one that we would find attractive because it ranks people as gold, silver, or bronze. It's deeply inegalitarian. And closer still in time to us, Aristotle takes the idea of giving people their justice-based due and breaks it down into distinct ideals of justice that resonate to this day. Corrective justice, I was talking about this in this lecture theatre just earlier on this afternoon. So timeline number one gives us all of that. There are different ways of representing timeline number one. I fear that time is moving against me, so I won't give you another account of the same timeline. Um, what I will do is pose the question, what emerges from it? Well, assemblages of norms yielding systems of law that constitute fields of interpretive possibility. These assemblages of norms or fields provide space for models of human association such as the one Plato describes. They accommodate plural values. They're sustained by practical attitudes and we see the idea of authority at work within the system. We also see law's intimate association with other practices, among them politics. And we can draw from this the assumption that law is extricably intertwined with other practices. We can do, as it were, a kind of pure theory of law job on what we find on timeline one, and zero in tightly on law, but law is extricably intertwined with much else besides law. Let's now turn to timeline two. This is, in a sense, our home. We participate in what I call the egalitarian philosophy of government. 
and I'll trace its development from the 17th century up to more recent times. After the English Civil War in Leviathan, Thomas Hobbes memorably tells us that without law, we can't in enjoy the good of order or peace. And in an egalitarian spirit, he emphasises that every person has an equal interest in the good of order or peace, and it's a good that only law can deliver. His contribution to this body of thought is critiqued in the 18th century by Immanuel Kant, who says, in order for law to be good law, in order for the good state to be established, in order to act in conformity with the universal principle of justice, you must ensure that law allows the most freedom to everyone alike. Without that, you've put in place an imperfect system of law. Kant is then himself critiqued by his compatriot Hegel, who puts in place a yet more exacting egalitarian requirement. Not merely must we pursue equal maximum liberty, but we must have an active interventionist state that promotes human freedom, that reduces the gap between empirical, imperfect people and our ideal, autonomous selves. Now, there are different ways of tracing that time <coughs> there, but we can see the process of ramification going on along that timeline, and if we pose the question, what emerges from it, we can draw conclusions much like timeline one. Assemblages of legal norms yielding fields of interpretative possibilities, system and coherence. The system provides a home for models of human association. It accommodates plural values. We see an internal point of view. We see authority. And we see law of intimate association with practices that are not strictly legal, political, and economic. And we can draw the conclusion that law, practically speaking, is extricably intertwined with other practices. And if we put the spade work in, we could work up a Kelsenian pure theory of law. Now, in my own work, I've tried to work up an analytical framework that would enable us to make sense of what's going on along these timelines. Let me introduce you to the well-known Tweedy trio, H.L.A. Hart, the legal philosopher, Michael Oakshot, and Isaiah Berlin. Hart, of course, famous for his examination of the legal system in the concept of law, law as a union of primary and secondary rules, yielding a field of interpretive possibility to use my lingo, heavy emphasis on the attitudes that sustain law, the internal point of view, but weak on models of human association and weak on value pluralism. If you introduce Oakshot into the Hartigan picture, you get a much richer account of relevant models of human association, at least within the European tradition, the modest rule-governed framework named civil association, the highly instrumental, goal-focused approach called enterprise association, an uneasy standoff between them, a kind of competitive pluralism, neither model entirely eclipsing the other, but in our context, increasing prominence being given to enterprise association. Now, that is a useful framework, but there's plenty more work that might be done. I'll just flag up um, how Berlin adds to the picture. He throws light on the ways in which systems of law accommodate plural values and problems associated with plural values. We may not be able to combine them. We may not be able to rank them, the problems of uncombinability and incommensurability. We might use our general pattern of life for us, an egalitarian pattern of life, as a guide as to how we negotiate the difficulties these values give rise to. When you bring these three together, you end up with the Hart Oakshot Berlin based interdisciplinary theory, or Hobbit. Um, we can do more with this. We can dwell on the normativity of law. Hart says that it's not necessarily moral. Oakshot dissents from that view. He assumes the normativity of law to be moral. That's a large topic. I'm not going to get into that now. What I will discuss briefly are factors that might erode the authority of law. I think useful work can be done in this area. Law's authority may erode because it operates unjustly, operates inefficiently, it's not properly operationalised. Let me give you an example to focus the issue. 
If we go back to Tudor and Stuart times, go right back to Henry VII, Henry on occasion would resort to prerogative taxation, the crude use of law to extract money from the populace. <coughs> Later along this timeline, Elizabeth I would on occasion address the Crown's financial weakness by resorting to prerogative taxation. She failed as a result to address what David Scott calls Little England's Great Discovered Strength, the problem of Little England's Great Discovered Strength. England was becoming a more prominent player on the international scene. The funding basis on which it might grow to prominence had not been sorted out adequately by political legal means. The problem wasn't resolved when the Stuarts entered the picture. They, of course, infamously result, uh, resort to prerogative taxation. The authority of law rapidly erodes. There's a descent into civil war, not just for that reason, but it's in the mix. The cataclysm to which Hobbes responds in Leviathan. I mention all of this now because we can see the way in which law's distinctive authority may be put at risk as a result of its intertwined relationship with these other practices. This is an area where I think more work could usefully be done. But what I'm going to do now, before I move towards some conclusions, is draw a problem or a puzzle to your attention, and it connects the two timelines of the metros. Um, here I'm concerned with law and the individual and what we might think in terms of as a tale of two chessboards. If we go back to timeline number one, Alistair McIntyre, looking at the society described by Homer, says that it operates very much on the model of chessboard. There's a place for everyone, um, a strong assumption that everyone should occupy their place, and that really describes what should be going on in their lives. He goes on to say that the framework can't be chosen. It's only within the framework of rules and precepts that people are able to frame purposes at all. A little later along timeline one, Ehrenberg argues that you can see the individual coming into focus. But what Homer is bringing into view is that that political legal chessboard is not fostering a strong sense of individualism. Now move much closer to us. We're now on timeline two. And George Orwell argues that in our egalitarian context, there may be a broadly similar problem that we have to wrestle with. Orwell complains in the road to Wigan Pier of the desire to reduce the world to something resembling a chessboard. And he associates this with the desire to promote a sense of order which is out of control, hypertrophied. And he associates this with a group of people whom he calls the clever ones. And he argues that if we're not careful, it could be that the clever ones, a group he also calls, uh, calls a, di a dictatorship of the prigs, could establish a context in which the organization of everything for everybody, everywhere, all of the time is going on until there's nothing left to live for. Now, Orwell may be getting somewhat radicalized by his own rhetoric there, but I mention this second chessboard problem precisely because we have a very strong sense of the individual and we associate law with efforts to underwrite and promote the interests of the individual. Now, just to sort of sum all of this up, on timeline one, at an early point, the individuals on McIntyre's analysis, not a prominent part of the sea, the individual demonstrably comes into focus when we look at Hobbes and Kant and Hegel. There's a suggestion that the individual may, later along that timeline, be taking on a somewhat embattled appearance. Ben Wilson expresses concern about this in a very recent book. Um, I won't dwell on this at greater length now, but um, I will say that what this raises in my mind is the issue that, as a pragmatic anthropologist, for want of a better self-description, I see law both as a useful resource and potentially a practical menace. And this poses in my mind the question, how should we respond to the history that I have been surveying? 
And I take as my starting point here a quotation from the novelist Don DeLillo. DeLillo says, you have a history that you are responsible to. You're answerable. You're required to make sense of it. You owe it your complete attention. Now, when I first read that and thought about myself, I thought, why should I be answerable to history? Who says I've got to be answerable to it? But in this context, I think the idea of answerability makes sense. Let me explain why. And here I draw on David Hume. David Hume, both as philosopher and anthropologist. My bridling of what Delillo says, I think, connects with Hume the philosopher. History is a collection of facts, a lot of is. And Hume, of course, famously says you can't move from <coughs> is to ought. But Hume also says in an anthropological spirit, we don't like the idea of our world being morally inert. We hunger after meaning. We don't want to inhabit a howling wilderness. It holds no attractions for us. Humankind has a natural propensity to ethicise and to moralise. If our philosophical speculations induce in us the belief that there is no fact of the moral matter, in short order, we find them strained, ridiculous, revolting. We're repelled by that idea. We cast round for reasons for action. Those timelines may yield, indeed often do, attractive reasons for action, to which we should often be responsive. And I'll give an example to bring that into focus right at the end of the lecture. I, I'll move to my conclusions now. Um, the first of my conclusions, the Hart Oakshot Berlin based framework, I think is useful. It helps us gain some tight purchase on both timeline one and timeline two. And if we think of law as a normative space on the model I've been describing, and there I take my cues very much from Hart, it prompts the question what's going on in that space? What do lawyers do in that space? And my answer to that is, well, a lot of the time they're concerned with what we might think of as recipe concepts. For example, the requirements of liability that make up common law torts. On occasion, they're concerned with developmental concepts. For example, the idea of incrementalism, developing the law within normative space. And on occasion, they're concerned with what I'm going to call calibration concepts, such as proportionality, accommodating competing practical concerns in the context of a particular case. My second point is that the idea of law as a practice is, I think, a helpful corrective against the strong philosophical urge to try and say the last word on law. The practice-based approach helps to counter over-emphatic statements of position on what law is. The idea is, it, is as, as it were, to serve up a final vocabulary or make some grand declaration outside of time and space, a kind of sub specie eternitatis declaration. And I think people are prone to that all too often where legal philosophy is concerned. And there's a real danger that what they're exhibiting is the enormous condescension of history that somehow or other happily for them, but at this point in history, we know what law means and we can sum it all up. The practice-based approach still assumes that law is a project that's unfolding and we should hesitate to assume that we've said the final word on this extended millennia-long project. But that brings with it what I call the problem of the legal minimum. Where precisely does the legal minimum lie? What I'm getting at here is the descriptivist concern, what are the necessary conditions that must be in place in order for law to exist? If law starts naively or crudely, we might be forced to conclude that commands, unconditional threats, that establish patterns of behavior look like a rough and ready instance of law. And that might support the conclusion that variously Papa Dr. Valier's Haiti, the activities of ISIS, the Nazi self-understanding as providing the world with an ordinance of act, are crude instances of law. So I think there's a lot to be said for the practice-based approach, but it, it struggles with what we can think of as the legal minimum. 
it has very considerable virtues. It helps us with the complexity of law. Let me give you an example to bring this into focus. At the end of the Second World War, General Douglas MacArthur was given plenipotentiary powers in Japan. And he operated very much on the crude command model. He issues commands to the effects that there must be in Japan a separation of church and state, the abolition of Shinto, land reform. But he's doing this in pursuit of the agenda, summed up in the phrase the egalitarian philosophy of government. He wants to improve women's rights. He wants to secure the interests of trade unions. He wants freedom of assembly and freedom of the press. Now, in a sense, he's treating the Japanese population as objects of his commands, but he's also treating them as subjects in the making and propelling them in the direction of a richer conception of law in which we should always seek to treat people as subjects. Um, on law's relationship with other practices, political, economic, and, and other, I've mentioned on a number of occasions the idea that law is extricably intertwined with these other practices. Law's authority may derive in part from these associated practices and be put at risk by them. I just want to say briefly in passing that we can accept that view of law and still maintain our responsibilities as lawyers to the distinct practice of law and seek to ensure that, that law operates wherever possible in a more rather than less refined way and stays true to its animating aims. Um, a few words on practice and pragmatic anthropology. I see law as an expression of what we are and may become. It, it fits with the Kantian agenda, and it may yield this approach, connecting up with pragmatic anthropology, a test of law's acceptability. Law as a practice that fits with our best or most eligible conception of ourselves as brought into focus through, well, the practice of law. Law helps us develop a more adequate understanding of our own potential. Uh, and applying them than pieces on a chessboard. With Roberto Unger, I want to say there's more in us than there is in the institutional and discursive world that we make and inhabit. Um, I've raised the point about the individual on those timelines. I'll move towards my conclusion. People have asked me, why Bruegel? I think fearing that I was turning into a sort of aging teenager painting my bedroom black. Um, there is a reason for using Bruegel. The painting's ambiguous. Uh, you can read it as eschatological. You can read it as connecting up with the end of days, the book of revelations. But there's a secular reading that Bruegel meant to be a part of the painting. The corpses are our own future selves, people who failed to manage the institution of law effectively and to secure human interests. Bruegel wrote at the time of the wars of religion in Europe following the Reformation. That problem was very much on his mind. As I said at the very beginning, were the beneficiaries of a rich legal tradition. But didn't you shudder the day you heard the news concerning Malaysian Airlines flight MH17, the picture of which appears on the right of the screen? That was a day when the practice of law was frankly abandoned by the people who chose to shoot that plane out of the sky. It was an abandonment of the idea on the plane of international law of a world made of law, an idea populated by Woodrow Wilson and his advisor Edward Hans. Law is an escape from that problem, and law is a framework for exploration. It's a means to the end of pragmatic anthropology, and I think what we end up with, if we see law in these ways, is a practice something along the lines argued for by Hegel, but without the heavy duty metaphysics. And that brings my lecture to a close. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Richard, for that very interesting uh, lecture. Lots to think about. I thought we'd be challenged, and I think we have been challenged, to think deeply about some of these issues. We have time for questions, if anyone would like to...
put some questions to Richard before we conclude. I've been trying to situate, Richard, uh, what you've just said in uh, what I know of uh, things you've said previously. And so rather than pose a question, I wonder if I could just ask for some clarification. The tradition uh, that I took you uh, in, in your previous work uh, to be so pleased with broadly a tradition that uh, is a question uh, that has disagreement uh, at its heart. Uh, law is not meant to provide universal solutions, but uh, provide a framework for the uh, non-warlike mediation of disputes between uh, mm. interests. And yet in this talk you seem very much to be conceiving of a single universal concept of uh, humanity uh, based on a, if I understand it right, broadly Kantian philosophic anthropology. Uh, these seem to me to be inconsistent views. Okay. And I wonder if you could clarify. I think the best response I can give to that is what I've unfolded today is perhaps best thought of in terms of a legal constitution, a finite normative space. And that space can accommodate a fair amount of disagreement. I mean, to take a mundane example from the UK, if you sort of posit a system, this is both simple in a way, but if you posit parliamentary sovereignty as the highest order normative system and see the system radiating out beneath it, it's perfectly possible to have, say, in the sphere of administrative law, a green light conception and a red light conception that are pushing in quite different directions. So I think what I'm arguing for accommodates conflict. And it may be, that the, if you go back to the controversy in the 90s, for example, where Stephen Sedley and John Laws argued that so active had the judges being, had, so active has, has, had the judges been in the post-war decades that you could, in a sense, reason your way out of that system and end up in a new system where parliamentary sovereignty itself could come under attack from, from the judges. Now, I think to the extent that that sort of thing starts to happen, you're moving away from a simply legal constitution into the sphere of broadly speaking, a political constitution. And I'd like to think that, well, that what I'm saying here today doesn't cut me off from the possibility of that happening. I'm conscious that I've been highly schematic today, and a refinement in response to your point would be to explore the shape of conflict within systems and the way in which it can carry you outside of them. And I don't want to cut myself off from the possibility of that happening. But my, my primary aim today was, in a kind of institutional spirit, to serve up a framework for the analysis of law, hence the heavy emphasis on Hart Oakshot from Berlin, and also to serve up, which is new for me, a kind of foundational rationale for law but I was astonished, I confess it's a recent discovery for me, the fact of Kantian anthropology. I can see that I've, as it were, read my way past it over the years, but Loudon, who I referred to on the slide, brought it very sharply into focus. And I discovered that Kant had been writing on this subject for decades. And it's, it's, it's a kind of corrective to the heavy emphasis on the moral law and the idealised individual who grasps it. And it has pushed me in a Kantian di direction, but I think I can square it with my Hegelian enthusiasms and still accommodate conflict. David, does that answer your question? Well, look, can I ask you, for, again for my benefit, Richard, the MacArthur example. I'm sorry, this is asking you to state your views crudely. Do you approve of what he did or not? And do you approve of the current MacArthur's who are trying to 
uh, impose clearly a specific idea of adequate political life. Or oh. political societies that perhaps do not want to have that political... Uh, okay, well, uh, to, to start with num number one, um, I think they couldn't have chosen, in a sense, a worst exemplar of a regime committed to the pursuit of good intentions in Douglas MacArthur. In all sorts of ways, he was an unhappy choice. Uh, precisely because he so naturally fits the model of the uncommanded commander. You know, MacArthur the brute, let's say. You know, not the best choice. But when you look at the aspirations of the Japanese regime at the time of, say, Pearl Harbor and before, its participation in the Axis, the kind of world it wanted to usher into existence, something that moves us out of the prospect of that happening is entirely welcome to me. Um, so I can live with the substantive agenda. I doubt I could have endured five minutes with Douglas MacArthur. Um, coming further up to date, I, I'm assuming what you're getting at is the kind of incautious optimism in the years <coughs> since the announcement that we live at the end of history. Uh, and what does trouble me about this, and this is why I place some considerable emphasis on Isaiah Berlin, is that that optimism seemed to hold out the prospect that we could ultimately become our ideal selves as opposed to our empirical selves. And something I didn't get into this lecture, which had far too many slides in it anyway, but I was tempted to bring into it, was a simple contrast to bring my aims into view. And if you want the point to carry away from the lecture, this is it. I think we live in a context where we have to make a pretty fundamental choice between the strong impulse to pursue what you might call fine calibration, where we think we're so smart, we can figure out precisely what's good for everybody, we can work up institutional mechanisms to secure that, and we can show that we are indeed the ideal and the political good sense to speed that project along. I doubt that. And for that reason, I think you need to set alongside fine calibration, to use the language of American free speech jurisprudence, breathing space. We need breathing space. My assumption is that I'm never going to even approximate my ideal self. I don't mean to sound like St. Augustine, I'm not talking about original sin or anything like that, but I think, you know, to use a Don DeLillo phrase, you know, I'm an instance of the typical human shambles. You know, we are imperfect, and we need to put in place a system that allows some measure of breathing space for humankind to be human. We shouldn't cut ourselves off from our aspirations. Pragmatic anthropology is a big part of such project as I wish to pursue. But we need to accommodate both some measure of commitment to find calibration and set alongside it breathing space. And if we don't do that, I don't think we're doing the job properly. Okay. Thanks very much, Richard. Okay.